And the whole book of Isaiah that we're studying is about salvation. <clears throat> the very first chapter that we looked at last week started out with the identifying Isaiah as the son of Amoth and that he was prophesying. And, and really, it's a court scene. And Isaiah is the appointed prosecutor by God to make a case against the nation Israel, particularly Judah and Jerusalem. It says that this is the vision that he saw. So he was a seer, which meant he actually sees the vision, and he sees things happening, and then he records them in God's word. And so he's the prosecutor. The defendant is the nation Israel, God's people, and the jury that is summoned is actually heaven and earth. They're actually not a jury to make a decision. They're a jury just to be witness to the case. We saw last time that there was a charge. It says, he says, listen, the ox knows his master, and the donkey knows the, the master's crib, but my people do not know they're a bunch of wayward, spoiled brats. What he's really saying is, you're dumb as an ox, and you're more stubborn than a jackass, because they listen and they know but my people do not know. That's the charge. The evidence he then summons, and it's a lot of evidence. They've been beaten from head to toe from guilt. They know they're guilty. They've been rebellious, they're corruption, and they have perverted everything. They've even perverted worship. They have perverted even their prayers. And so he summons all this evidence, and then he pronounced the verdict, they're guilty. That's at this point that Isaiah the prophet says, but God has a pardon to offer. And he says, listen, if you would just wash yourself, if you would just change who you are, he says, and turn to the Lord, we call that repentance, then you will be pardoned. And I told you last time about a man by the name of Wilson who committed a crime of mail fraud, was found guilty because he pretty nearly killed a man and he was sentenced uh, capitally to give his life, but President Jackson actually gave him a pardon, but Wilson refused the pardon. He'd rather die than take a pardon from the president. Well, then this is what happened. It went to the Supreme Court. Does he have the right to deny the pardon? And the Supreme Court in 1833 declared that you have a right to deny the pardon if you don't want it. Wow. It's amazing. God is offering a pardon, but you have to receive it. In fact, that's the way he winds up the chapter. He says, listen, though your sins be as scarlet, he says, they will be as white as snow if you accept the pardon. Though they be red like crimson, they will be white like wool. He says the final sentence is this, either you accept the pardon or... He goes on to say, you, you are like kindling wood, and your works are like the spark to set yourself on fire in judgment. You see, Jesus came into the world not to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. You are condemned already because you have not believed in the only begotten Son of God. Listen, he doesn't have to condemn you. You've already issued your own sentence if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Savior from your sin because the pardon is there and available. He ended the chapter, and he starts the second chapter, what I'm calling today the day in the king's court. That was the trial in the king's court. Today we're looking at the day in the, the king's court. Actually, there's more than one day mentioned here. He says, this is what Isaiah the son of Amos saw. Again, he's seeing concerning Judah and Jerusalem. He said, I'm not changing the subject here. This is a continuation of before. In fact, this very first verse of the second chapter is so identical to the first one, it's just missing a few little details about the kings that he were reigning at that time, but it's basically the same. And he's saying, listen, in the king's court, there is a day coming, and I'm looking at the day, and he says, this is it, in the last days. In the last days. Isaiah is looking down through the tunnel of time, and he is seeing what is going to happen in the last days for Israel. 
And you might notice there, I got this gates to like a glorious kingdom because there is a kingdom coming to the nation Israel. They have never had this kingdom. They won't have it until the future. In fact, it is still future today. We live in the church age. The church age began after Jesus died on the cross, was buried, rose from the grave, was on the earth for 40 days, and then he was taken up into heaven. Ten days later on Pentecost, the 50th day after his resurrection, the Holy Spirit came and baptized the believers into the body of Christ of which Jesus is the head. That was the birth date of the church. The church began that day, Acts chapter 2. And the church is continuing on down through the ages, and here we are, we got Bethany Church up there to represent the whole church age. The church age will end when the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive, if he comes in our lifetime, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Isn't that great? Jesus is going to come back, and that's exactly what he told the disciples in the upper room. Let not your hearts be troubled. Since you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so we're going to the Father's house. Jesus is coming back. Now, Isaiah looks beyond all that. Isaiah, he's seeing beyond all that. In fact, the next thing in the prophetic calendar, after the church is gone, is the day of the Lord begins, and it's a time of Jacob's trouble. It's a time that has never been before or ever will be after. It's a time of darkness and gloom. It's a time of war. It's a time of pestilence. It's a time of, uh, uh, you just name it. If it's bad, li listen, it's literally hell on earth. It's a short period of time because Jesus said had it, not been, it had to be shortened for the elect's sake that somebody would survive. At the end of that, the Lord himself will come back to the earth and he will set up this kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, here on earth. John in the Revelation tells us in chapter 20, six times he tells us, it will last 1,000 years where King Jesus will rule in a day of light and brightness, holiness and righteousness for 1,000 years. He then adds in the next chapter that the current heaven and earth will be passed away and there will be a new heaven and earth for all eternity so that this 1,000-year kingdom that we see in the Scriptures is like an introduction to the eternal state. It's the prelude of living with God forever and ever. This is on God's calendar. This is what it is. He says, in the last days, let's pick up there. The last days in the king's court. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established. There is going to be a temple in Jerusalem Right now where the Dome of the Rock is, that's going to be gone, and the temple of the Lord is going to be rebuilt during the tribulation period, and then in the kingdom that's coming, according to Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48, it's going to be a massive expansion on the temple, and there's going to be a temple on the mountain of the Lord. Now, the mountain of the Lord is Mount Zion in Jerusalem. It's also known as Mount Moriah. On Mount Moriah is where Abraham, years ago, went with his son Isaac, and he built an altar because God had told him to offer his son Isaac on the altar. And he went there, and he built it, and he put the sticks on there, the wood, and he, he put his son on it all bound up, and he raised his hand to plunge him in as a sacrifice to the Lord, and the Lord stopped him and said, now I know that you truly, you truly worship me. And there was a sacrificial ram that was put in his place, all depicting, all of this depicting the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is God's son. He came, offered himself, but he was a substitute like the ram. He took our place. And so the picture is just so beautiful there. It's at this place on this mountain, the mountain of the Lord, as the, he's going to appoint it as the chief among the mountains. 
Isaiah will later say, every mountain will be made low and every valley will be raised. There's going to be a, type, a topological change of the whole holy land. And it says, because this mountain is going to be chief among the mountains. Mount Hermon won't be the highest anymore. Mount Zion will be the highest. The temple of the Lord, you'll be going up to the temple of the Lord. It will be raised above all the hills. It will be the, the gem. It will be the place where Messiah comes and he rules. And he is a king and priest in the temple. All the nations will stream to it. I don't know if you've counted the nations lately, but there's a lot of them. All the nations in that time in the kingdom. You, you see, it's not just going to be Israel in the kingdom. The whole globe is going to have people all over the globe and, and the disciples are going to, the, the, the apostles are going to have seats of authority and, and you and I are going to be reigning in different capacities who know Jesus. And sometimes people ask me, is United States in the Bible? Yes. If United States is still a nation at this time, all the nations will stream into it. There's going, you say, it was always God's intention to save people from all mankind not just the Jewish nation. Even when he called Abraham, he said, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. It was God's intention through the nation Israel to bring a Messiah, and the Messiah, he would bless all the nations of the earth. All the nations are going to stream into the kingdom, and the kingdom, they're going to, they're going to come and worship the Lord in his holy temple. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. They're all going to come to worship. Going to come to worship. And then it says, he will teach his ways. If you're taking notes, you need to write down Zechariah 6.13. Actually, the couple of verses before and after it are really good too. Because it says, in this time when God sets up the kingdom, the branch, which is a messianic title for Messiah the Christ, he will sit as a king and a priest on a throne in the temple because he is a king. He's the king of the Jews. He's the king of all kings, Lord of all lords. And he is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. He will be a king and a priest. Now, I know from the, the uh, priest Ezra in the Old Testament, the book of Ezra, that the duty of a priest was to teach the word of God. And so it says here, here, Messiah, Jesus Christ, will teach his ways so that we may walk in his path. I don't know about you, but I tend to be a little wayward on the path that God has set before me. I tend to stray. You know what I, Isaiah says later, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. We're not on the path that God wants us. Not so in the kingdom. In the kingdom, the nations, all the nations of the earth will follow and walk in the path because this kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness and holiness. And King Jesus rules and reigns in righteousness and holiness. The law will go out from Zion. The word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The word, when we go into the, the, the temple and, and we worship the Lord, we go out and we spread what we've learned. It's going to be great in the kingdom. It's going to be great in the kingdom. He will judge between the nations. The nations today are at war with each other. And Jesus said there will be war. A nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. But, but he, Messiah the king, he will judge between the nations and he will settle all disputes for many people. Whew. He's going to bring all the nations of the world together. Isn't it going to be amazing? It's going to be an amazing, amazing time. Listen to this. He goes on, he says, in this coming kingdom, they will beat their swords. I got a couple of golden swords up there. Did you notice that? They're going to beat their swords into plowshares. Now, plowshare is that blade on the plow. I just took an old-fashioned kind. I could have took a, a modern tractor trailer. I mean, a big tractor, you know, those jumbo ones. where They got like rows of them. All these swords are going to be beaten into plowshares. And they're, they're going to till the ground. What is he saying? Not going to be any war. Not going to be a war for that thousand years. Wow. Not till the very end. For a little season, there's a rebellion. And after that, he puts it down and establishes the eternal state. They will beat their swords into plowshares. They will take their spears and they're going to turn them into pruning hooks. 
Instead of going after people, they're going to go after crops. It's a time of prosperity. It's a time of glory. It's going to be a wonder. You see, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And that's what he's saying to a nation that has got an ungodly king like Ahaz. Okay, He's saying, nations will not take up the sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. I don't know if you can read that very well, but it's actually the same verses I just quoted. It's on a little, it's on a wall in a small park that is right across from the United Nations. Right across from the United Nations. It, it, it says this, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And then it's got the inscription, Isaiah. <laughs> the sad part is the United Nations cannot bring peace to this world. They could put that on every stone in the United Nations, but man, sinful man, cannot bring peace to this world. The only one that can bring peace is what Isaiah calls in chapter 9, verse 6, the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ alone. And Jesus Christ alone will bring peace to this world. And because we know that, there's light at the end of the tunnel. I don't care how much turmoil, anxiety, frustration you have in your life. You look to the end and you know God is going to give me peace ultimately. I will have peace. I will have peace. I will have peace. So he says, come, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. He's, Isaiah is saying, he's making the application, listen, you've got to walk in the light of the Lord. And who is the light? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It is a light that invigorates us into eternal life. When we know Jesus and we walk the way Jesus wants us to walk, we are walking in the light. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. Hmm. It's an emancipating temple because it's going to free us. It's going to free us. It's going to free us. Now, there's dark days ahead, though. Before we get to that light at the end of the tunnel, he says there's dark days ahead, and so he backs up just a little bit. Remember, we're in the church age, and after the church age, then comes the rapture, takes us out of here, and after that is this dark and dismal time. Jesus called it a time of tribulation, and then he adds, because it gets more intense as time goes on, the last three and a half years of it, he calls the great tribulation. You think you've got problems now? It's nothing compared to what is coming. Thank God, if you know, you know Jesus as your Savior, you're out of here. You're not here for that. You've gone to heaven, to the judgment seat of Christ. You're missing all of this. But when Jesus comes back, he is going to destroy all, all the, the evil, and he's going to set up this glorious kingdom but before he does that, he says, listen, I want to focus on the dark days that are ahead. Yeah, there's light at the end of the tunnel. But there's darkness that comes before the dawn. And he says, here's the darkness. There's dark superstitions. He says, you have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob. They are full of superstitions. <laughs> Superstition. So I put a black cat up there. I could put a ladder, not don't walk under the ladder. I, I, we could put a lot of things under. Uh, got to be careful what you do on Friday the 13th. Uh, I, you got all that nonsense, nonsense, okay. It says, the superstitions from the east. Now, in the day of, of, of Daniel, which comes a little bit after Isaiah, in the day of Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has what he's collected together as the wise people to give him counsel. And you find them in chapter 2, and you find them in chapter 6. You find them in different places these people are mentioned. They are called magicians. How many of you have ever been to a magic show? <laughs> yeah. And you know they're deceiving you, right? You know, you, you know, that person really isn't sawn in half, correct? Yeah. 
It, it's a deception. It's a dece- you're, you're being deceived. That, that's the whole idea here. You're being deceived. They followed the magicians. The, and, and another word is soothsayers. Uh, the soothsayers is like the diviners. They're, they're trying to predict the future. The, these diviners often, and instead of using the crystal ball and looking in there, uh, or like today, they look at your hand and they say, oh, I can see your lifeline. And they tell you, they're, they're trying to tell you the future. They, they, they practice the divination. In the ancient world, they split an animal open and they grab out some organ out of it and they'd read it and tell you what your future is. <laughs> Didn't work very well. This is what they were following. Rather than following the Lord, they were taking local current nonsense. It says, and like the Philistines, they've clasped their hands with pagans. They're shaking hands with the pagans. They're trying to bring Christ, uh, there is, is the Israel Jewish faith in harmony with all these idolatrous religions. One of the former kings of the northern kingdom, Israel, he made a golden calf and said, this is Jehovah who brought us out of Egypt. Mixing idolatry with the true faith that the invisible God, that he's a calf, this is the nonsense that is going on. It's dark paganism that's going on. He says, you have abandoned the principles. Listen, there's dark money. Their land is full of silver and gold. Oh, see what? They have plenty of gold and silver, and so they don't need God. I I can take care of myself. There is no end of their treasures. Their land is full of horses. They have all they need. They even got their own defense system. There is no end to their chariots. Uh, I can take care of myself. Who needs God? Who needs God? They're so prosperous, so prosperous. Sort of reminds me of America today. We're so prosperous. There's dark worship. Their land is full of idols. We have idols. I mean, obviously, this guy is kissing his Oscar. Watch what it says. They bow down to the work of their own hands. He worships what he's done himself. To what their fingers have made, so that man will be brought low and mankind humble. Do not forgive them. Ooh. A time is coming when God says, listen, you're gonna, it's payday someday. You're going to get what you deserve. There's dark hiding. He says, go into the rocks and hide. He says, in the ground from the, the dread of the Lord. You get that? The dread of the Lord? And the splendor of his majesty. You see, when the Lord returns in all of his glory, there's going to be a dread. I think my power went out. Am I still on? All right. I, I guess it, I, get a little, I get a little too animated here. Sorry about that. <laughs> They're going to hide because when Christ returns and they look on him whom they have pierced, the text says, oh my goodness, you're either going to look with faith or you're going to hide in a hole. You're going to hide from the Lord. The eyes of the arrogant man will be humbled And the pride of men will be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. The Lord's going to be exalted. You see, he came the first time as the Lamb of God. He comes the second time as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He came the first time to take away our sins and offer us pardon. He comes the second time to judge your sins if you haven't accepted his pardon. Whoa. You see, the next verse says this, a reckoning day is in the king's court. The Lord Almighty has said, or has a day in store. (laughs) The day is coming for all the proud, the lofty, all that exalted. Listen, he says, and they will be humbled. God is going to bring them down. In Hebrews chapter 9, it says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. You know, I've broken a few appointments in my lifetime. When I was a kid, I liked breaking that dentist appointment. 
because I knew the pain that that doctor enjoyed inflicting on me. <laughs> I've broken some doctor appointments. I've broken some car appointments. I've even broken appointments uh, that I should have been at the church, but whoops, I plumb forgot. This is one appointment you cannot break. God has appointed the day of our death. And after that, there's a reckoning. What have you done with my son? Have you accepted his pardon or have you rejected it? A day is in store. A day is in store, he says, for all the cedars of Lebanon. Now, I, I don't think he's actually talking about the trees. I think he's talking about lofty, arrogant people. Those who say there is no God. For the cedars of Lebanon, tall and lofty, and all the oaks of Bashan. He says, for all the towering mountains and the high hills, everybody thinks they're on top of it all. For every lofty tower and every fortified wall. He goes on, he says, for every trading ship and every stately vessel. He says, the arrogance of man will be brought low on the day of reckoning. And the pride of men, they will be humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. And idols will totally disappear. Because it will be the Lord and the Lord alone that will be worshipped in the coming kingdom. They will flee from the presence of the Lord. Whoa. Not it's just from the presence of the Lord. It's from the dread of the Lord. They dread that this is going to happen, and it's happening in their lifetime. It's happening, and they dread him. It reminds me of the verse in Hebrews. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Since we live in an age of grace, in the church age, where God is giving us constantly mercy, he's withholding from us what we do deserve, and then he's giving us blessings we don't deserve. We sometimes forget about the holiness, the righteousness, and the justice of God. And a day is coming when there's going to be a reckoning, and it's going to be a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In the book of the Revelation, it says in the fifth chapter, John also seeing these visions. He said, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne. That is Jesus Christ. He has this scroll in his hand. It's got writing on both sides, and it has sealed with seven seals. And Jesus takes this scroll, and what he does is he begins to open it, seal by seal. He cracks open the first one, and, and all of a sudden emerges in a vision a white horse with a rider on it, and he's got a bow in his hands, and almost all, all commentators take this to mean that this is deception of the Antichrist. Just like Jesus said, there's an Antichrist coming before the end of the age. The second, he cracks that one. Jesus cracks that open, and all of a sudden, there's a voice that is crying out, and it's a red horse rider, and this time, he's got a sword in his hand, and he's going out to take peace away from the earth. Jesus said there'd be wars and rumors of wars. Kingdom will rise up against kingdom. This is in that terrible, dreadful time that is coming in the, in the tribulation. He cracks open the third seal, and then there's a black horse that goes riding across the scene in his vision, and he sees he's got a balance in his hand, and it's a, a day's wages just to get a meal. Famine is coming, just like Jesus predicted with earthquakes and famines and all those things. Then he cracks open the next one, and on this one is a rider. It's a pale horse, and the rider is called Death. And somehow behind him is another personification Hades, or hell, is following him. He concludes at this point by saying with these four horse riders, one quarter of all human population has been wiped out. Whew. Judgment is coming. Darkness before dawn. He cracks open the fifth seal, and it says, then he saw the souls. Now, I don't know what souls look like, so I kind of take any little eyes, you know, out of Pac-Man and 
Souls were under the altar in heaven, and they're crying out for their vengeance because they have died for the word of God during these four horse riders going across. He then cracks open the sixth seal, and it says there's an earthquake like never was ever before in all of time. And you saw that there, didn't you, how I shook the earth? Yeah, yeah. I want to pick up there because that's exactly where Isaiah is at. When he's talking about this dreadful day of the Lord, he says, in Revelation 6, verse 12, he says, I watched as he opened that sixth seal. So let's open it. Boom, he pops that open. And there was a great earthquake. The sun turned to black like the sackcloth made of goat's hair. And the moon, the whole moon turned blood red. And the stars in the sky fell to the earth. I think that's a meteorite shower of some sort. The stars falling to the earth as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by the, the storm, a uh, strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll, rolling up as every mountain and island was moved from its place. This is a horrific earthquake that's coming. The kings of the earth and the princes and the generals, the rich and the mighty and every slave, every free man. He's trying to say, everybody is trying to find some safe place and they're hiding in caves among the rocks of the mountains, just like Isaiah said in verse 10. They call to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Wow. The dread of the Lord. They're dreading because they know they're guilty before God and judgment time has come. For the great day of their wrath has come. He's going to trample out the, the grapes of wrath of his vengeance on all those who oppose him. Back to Isaiah. He repeats what he said in verse 10. Men will flee to caves and rocks and holes in the ground from the dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. <laughs> in that day, they will throw away to the rodent and the bats their idols. They're finally, Israel's going to finally get rid of their idolatry. It's going to take a long time. Zechariah says, they look on him whom they have pierced. It's a look of faith and trust. And they get rid of all of this, which they, all the, all the stuff that they had made, the false gods. And they will flee into caverns and rocks and the overhanging crags uh, from the dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. Wow. What's the point of all this dread? Verse 22, he says, this is it. Stop trusting in man. Whew. We do it all the time. I put my confidence in the doctor and say, oh boy, woe is me. When I could pray and say, Lord, you are the great healer. We put our trust in a banker. We put a trust in our IRA. We put a trust in when we say, you know, the Lord, my God, will provide for all of my need according to his riches and glory. Stop trusting in man who has but a breath in his nostrils. It takes us all the way back to the Genesis when God formed man of dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils a breath of life. He said, listen, man has nothing that he has actually created. Everything that you have, you've gotten from God, including your breath. So he says, on what account is man so if you're going to stop trusting in man, then who are you going to trust? I go to the Proverbs for this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. You don't always have to get it. You say, God, I just don't get what you're doing here, but I'm trusting you, Lord. In all your ways, everything you're doing, every pathway that you have, you acknowledge him and he will make that pathway straight. You won't be that sheep that's gone astray. You stay right on the path. Trust the Lord with all your heart. I want you to take this with you today. 
Isaiah's looking down through the tunnel of time, and he sees these glory days coming, and he knows that before that, he's going past the church. He's going past the rapture. He knows that there's dark days coming ahead, but he says, go past that. Go past that. You see, when, when the church is out of here, we're going to go to heaven to be with the Lord. We won't be here for those dark days. God has not appointed us to wrath. It says in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 10. We'll be with him. And it says, and when, when he raptures us, we will ever be with the Lord. Wherever the Lord is, we'll be with him. So when he's in heaven, we're in heaven. When he returns, we return with him. When he enters the kingdom and sets it up, we enter the kingdom too. You know, I've never been to the Holy Land. People often ask me, are you going to go to the Holy Land? I said, I sure am. When Jesus comes back, I'm coming with him. I'm going to the Holy Land. I'm going to see the Holy Land. I'm going to see the Holy Land. I'll always be with the Lord. Always. We'll always be with him. Always be with him. But you have to know him to always be with him. Wow. This is history. It just hasn't happened yet because it is the word of the Lord. You have to put your trust in the Lord. Father in heaven, you've told us what's going to happen before it happened. It's right there in your word. We're so very thankful that we who know Jesus will be taken out of this world before the darkest hour comes. We'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive a reward for what we've done in our lives. And then when he returns, we will return with him. And we will enter this glorious period of time. We will, with all the nations, go up unto the house of the Lord where Jesus will be. Oh, my goodness, Lord. We look forward to these great times. Perhaps there's someone here who does not know Jesus Christ as Savior. We pray that today they would say, Lord, I come humbled and lowly, a sinner that needs your salvation. Save me from my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. Pardon from my sins and a home in heaven that I might be with Christ forever. Lord, we know that if they just pray a simple prayer that says, Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior who died for my sins, that they will be saved. And for us, may we who know the Lord be reassured there is light at the end of the tunnel. For this I pray in Jesus' name, amen.